All right, I got something I'm just excited uh, to show you. Walt Babcock has been helping us uh, for the better part of a year, maybe more, in kind of reclaiming some of what I call, you know, the DNA of Crossroads Church, but doing it in a slightly different way, uh, keeping it fresh, making it fresh for the future and uh, upcoming generations, but ensuring the DNA of this house thrives. And you can see that in our altars that we have brought back. There have been oper- altars in operation at this church for many, many years. We had some years where we did not have them. We have them again. And so, yes. So you can see in, in our way of trying to, you know, f- keep things fresh, we have our, what I call the standard kneelers. Then we have our family altars where families can come and huddle around and, and be head to head as opposed to in a linear line where by the time you get to child number two or three or four, you can't, you know, you're eight feet away from them. So I know that um, as I get older, the thought and the prospect of kneeling down at an altar, the getting down is not the hard part. It's the getting back up. You kneel down and you touch heaven and then by the time you get back up, you're filled with anger, rage, and malice, you know, and you got to, it's just like an up and down, you got to kneel down again and pray forgiveness for all the anger, and then you get up and you get filled with anger. We know it can become difficult in, in, in a very real way. It can be, become difficult, and I want every single member of our church to be able to pray and touch heaven at an altar. So we have, I've had Walt work with me, we have what I call our standing altars, So these will be, this is just a little example. This is the oak from our original altars. We're reclaiming as much as we can to keep that DNA. But, you know, if you have knee problems, these will be kind of around the back. Um, I love this because you can kneel down and you can get in that position. You can position yourself in a prayerful and mindful position and it not be bad on your knees and not be bad on your back. So um, he's starting to work on this. This is not just a prototype. This is one of them that you will see. And uh, I just, I was so excited. I just wanted to show you guys this and uh, um, let you know that they'll be coming in the next few weeks and months as we build more and more of these. So we are excited about that. So, yes. I would like to say thank you all so much for those who have given and, and contributed to this project. Um, it is, it's awesome and it is, it is humbling. With us today, because it is the 50-year anniversary, we wanted to do something special. So we have Carl Flagg, who is the National Director of the Royal Ranger Program out of Springfield, Missouri. He's been serving in that role for seven years And before that, he was in the Indiana District, working Christian education, a men's ministry director. Uh, Did that for, was it 15? 14. 14 years. So um, this is a a man with a heart for discipleship, a heart for the Royal Ranger program, a heart for reaching and mentoring young men and developing them into godly men. And so he's going to come. We're going to do like a a tag team kind of a thing. He's going to talk to us for 10, 15 minutes or so about discipleship, specifically the Royal Ranger program. And then I'm going to come in and uh, talk to you a little more about discipleship before we close things out. So if you would, put your hands together and give a crossroads welcome to Carl Fly. I was sitting in a restaurant in Orlando um, sometime back at lunch. And as I was sitting there, a man came walking past the table on his, to his table. And he hesitated for a second, and I thought he was going to say something, but then he went on. I didn't think anything more of it until all of a sudden he startled me because he was standing right in front of my table. So I looked up at him. He noticed, he told me that he noticed my Royal Ranger shirt. I was wearing a shirt with a Royal Ranger logo on the pocket, and he noticed that, and he stopped. He said, I need to tell you my story. He grew up in foster care. And every few years, he was in a different foster home. And he traveled from home to home like that. He had no home. He had no direction. He had no hope. And he said, one day I was in a foster. I moved into a new foster home. 
And they started taking me every week to a group called Royal Rangers. And he said, while I was there in that Royal Ranger group, for the first time in my life, I had men who cared about me. They spent time on me. They taught me how to do things. They showed me I was valuable, and they taught me about God. He said, after a couple of years, I moved on to the next house. But he said, that changed my life. Today, he's grown. He grew up. He's married. He has boys of his own. And he pastors a church in California. Amen. Royal Ranger makes a difference in the life of boys. Crossroads Church, I want to just say good morning to you. And thank you for the opportunity that I have to be here. Pastor Mark, thank you for this opportunity to talk about Royal Rangers and the ministry that you all have here in this church. As Pastor Mark said, this is Royal Ranger Week. And so you noticed some good-looking young people as you came in the door who greeted you in the, either their outpost t-shirts or in uniforms. You have a long legacy of mentoring boys here at this church. And as has already been stated, 50 years of Royal Ranger ministry out of Outpost 155. Congratulations on that. In fact, I understand that in 1977, your church here had the largest outpost in the world. And so that's pretty amazing, isn't it? So thank you for doing that. You know, it was wonderful for me to learn that you're, as I was preparing to come here, to find out that you're church has had Royal Rangers for the past 50 years. And as I thought about that, I couldn't help but wonder how many lives have been affected by Royal Rangers and the ministry that the men, that the men give over the years to those young boys. Boys like Hal Donaldson. Hal Donaldson, when he was 12 years old, he and his siblings, his brother and sister's world was turned upside down when their father was unexpected. Are you there? There you go. It was unexpectedly killed by a drunk driver. Over the next several years, because of the church and the ministries that were going on in that church, through Royal Rangers, he and his brothers were, were mentored by men. These men took it upon themselves to make sure that Hal Donaldson, while they could never fill the place of his father, would make sure that he grew up with the influence of a godly man in their lives. As a result of that, Hal and his brother Steve Convoy of Hope provides resources and cares to people all around the world after a disaster. In fact, last week I was watching America in the morning, and I happened to notice a, a, a report on a pastor who, was, who had turned his church into a resource center and a, in a relief center to the people in his town after the hurricane down south. And there, there in the background were two uh, Convoy of Hope trucks making a difference in the lives of people. What if those boys had fallen through the cracks after their childhood disaster? What if they'd been just another statistic of kids who are growing up without a male influence in their life? But thank God he had a plan, and he had people who were ready to stand up in the gap and to make a difference in boys' lives. And today, those boys are making difference in hundreds and thousands, if not millions of lives around the world. Boys across our country who were ministered to years ago have now grown up to be fathers themselves, and they're raising their own families and their own children in, the, in godly homes. Some of those boys have continued on to become leaders in the military, in businesses, in churches, in government, in sports. There you go. In sports, in, in a lot of different areas. In addition, some of those men have gone on to become commanders themselves, and today they're pouring their lives into the lives of boys. You see, it's through intentional discipleship and activity that we train up boys to become the next generation of godly men. And that's exactly what our mission in Royal Rangers is, is to raise the next generation or to mentor the next generation of Christ-like men and lifelong servant leaders. If you don't know anything about Royal Rangers, real quickly, let me take a few moments and tell you about it. Today, Royal Rangers is in 95 different countries. With 59 years of experience, we've learned what to do and what not to do in raising a young man. Today in Royal Rangers, there are three areas that when a boy comes to Royal Rangers that we focus on and we ensure that he gets training on. Number one is discipleship. Because we develop the spiritual lives of a young man. We recognize that we're not just raising men, but we want to raise godly men. The second priority that we have is skills. We teach boys stuff. 
They learn how to change tires. They learn how to sweat pipe. They learn how to do a number of different things because we understand that as a boy learns those things, he develops confidence. And we want them to know that how to do things. We want them to be confident in who they are. And the third thing we teach them is leadership so that as they learn how to be a leader, they can influence others and lead them. Things like camping, weekend adventure, awards, uniforms, these are all tools that we use to fulfill our mission. We also use things like sports and technology and trades, anything that we can to capture the attention of a boy. One of the truths that we learned and that we teach is that what with a boy, more is caught than taught. In other words, a boy will learn a lot more by observing and by watching than by what you say to him. That's why a young man, a boy, you can watch a boy when dad's out there mowing the grass. What's that little boy doing? He's got his little plastic mower and he's walking right along behind dad doing what dad does. Or when dad's working on a project and he's out there hammering away, that little boy has his, his little plastic tool set and he's doing the same thing. Because with boys, they naturally learn more by observation than they do by what's being told to them. And so boys need men to show them what it means to be a godly man. Because it's in the company of men that boys learn what a godly man looks like, how he acts, how he handles situations and challenges in life, how he deals with the things that life bring along to him. It's where they see how you take the theology that we hear in church and we learn in, in, in services and turns it into the biology of their nine to five day. In the absence of these godly role models, all boys have left is what they get from social media, television, or possibly their friends who know even less than they do. Today, more than ever, it's important for us to provide strong godly mentors for our young men. Did you know that we're in an epidemic today? And it's an epidemic of fatherlessness. You know what our statistics tell us? They say 71% of our boys in the United States of America grow up without a significant male influence in their lives. Two-thirds of those boys grow up in a home where dad is not around. It's, it's a single-parent home, and mom is left with the task of, of raising and, and, and supply, uh, providing and, and all of those things. The other third of our boys grow up in a home where dad just doesn't know how to engage with his young man. The U.S. Department of Education tells us in our, statistically that in our elementary school system, over 96% of our educators are ladies in the elementary school side of, of, of our education system. That means that during the formative years of a boy's life, when beliefs, identities, and foundational understandings are formed, most of our boys have no significant role model to help them understand the man that they were created to be. I wonder if that's part of the reason why we struggle with identity and gender issues today. Think about that. We're not only mentoring and discipling boys, but we also train and mentor, mentor men. An example of the quality of not only the boys, but the leaders who mentored them happened in this city just a few years ago. A couple years ago, a local outpost here in Oklahoma City went to a, a banquet for friends of NRA to volunteer their time and help in that banquet. While they were serving in that banquet, the, the, one of the board members of the NRA noticed them. And so he went up to the leader and, and, and invited him to come and be part of something, a, a hunt that they do, that they put on, that they sponsor with the um, Oklahoma Youth Hunting Program. What this basically is, it's a three-day guided hunt, fully funded, to teach families who have non-hunters how to hunt and enjoy the out of doors. And the, and the outpost commanders and their boys were invited to be part of that process. About a week after the hunt, the Royal Ranger commander called the board president to thank him for including the boys and allowing him to go on this, this hunt, which was quite an honor to be invited to be part of that. The president, when he called the president to say thank you, the president told him and said, let me tell you what has happened. He said that during the hunt, there was a noticeable difference between the commanders of Royal Rangers and the mentors of the other programs, including the parents who were on that hunt. They said that they noticed that there was a way, uh, uh, they were all highly impressed with the interaction between the commanders and the boys. And that there was a noticeable difference on how they all carried themselves and how they all reacted to one another. 
In fact, one of the landowners had noticed it and was so impressed with that Royal Ranger outpost that he said to the NRA president, he said, from now on, I only want Royal Rangers hunting on my land. The outpost that this happened to happened to be outpost 155 right here at Crossroads Church. Isn't that amazing? If you know how to bait a hook, fix a tire, sweat a pipe, or just about any other skill, we can use you. We will teach you whatever else you need to know about how to mentor a boy. You see, each and every one of us are on a journey. We're part of the big God story. And Ephesians chapter 2 says this, that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. Part of your journey to becoming a fully functional child of God, to reaching the full measure of who you are and who you were created to be, is that you take the gifts and the skills that you have and you reinvest them back into the kingdom into others. Titus says the older need to teach the younger. That's what we call mentorship. And a lot of times it's spending time with them. It's being able just to invest in them with your time, helping them see how you take that theology, take those spiritual truths that they learn in church and show them how they apply it to their everyday life. And when you do that, you make a difference. And Royal Rangers can help you make that difference. Pastor Mark, thank you for continuing to make Royal Rangers part of the ministry of this church. It shows that you understand the importance and the value of mentoring our young man, young men. Pastor Adam with the youth department and Pastor Melissa, what you do, and probably she's not here, she's probably back there ministering to your children. But thank you for the vital work you do investing in young people of this community. You see, children and youth ministry are a vital and critical part of what we do in Royal Rangers as well because together we reach the children as they teach the principles of God's Word to our kids. These ministries, along with the mentoring parts of Royal Rangers and girls' ministry, are like the two wings on an airplane that help our children and allow our children to learn and apply God's Word to their everyday life so that they can soar. And in the few minutes I have left this morning to each and every one of you leaders, I want to say thank you for investing in the young men and the young women of this church and this community. A number of years ago, there was a song written that said, thank you for giving to the Lord. And I think that song is so appropriate. It says this, it says, I dreamed I went to heaven and you were there with me. We walked upon the streets of gold beyond, beside the crystal sea. We heard the angels singing. Then someone called your name. You turned and you saw this young man, and he was smiling as he came. He said, Commander, you may not know me now. Then he said, but wait. You used to teach, teach my discovery group when I was only eight. And every week you would say a prayer before the class would start. And one day when you said that prayer, I asked Jesus in my heart, It goes on and says, one by one they came, far as the eye could see, each life somehow touched by your generosity. Little things that you had done, sacrifices made, unnoticed on the earth, in heaven now proclaimed. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am a life that was changed. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am so glad you gave. So to each one of you who are investing in the lives of children, our youth, I want to say thank you for doing that. In fact, if you are here and you are involved in Royal Rangers or Girls Ministry, would you stand just so we could recognize you all around? And then if you're involved in youth and children's ministry, in any way you are part of youth and children's ministry, would you stand up also? Thank you so much for the work that you do investing in the lives of our children. What you do makes a difference. Thank you. I remember being in a, uh, a conference talking about discipleship. That's why I like programs like Royal Rangers. I like programs like Girls Ministries. Because I'm in a conference talking about discipleship, and the, the speaker is 
talking about enrolling his kids in youth athletics and sports. And I had kids, you know, around the same age, just a few years ago. My kids were getting involved in, in sports at that time. And he said, you know, if, if you enroll your son in youth football program, first of all, that starts at like, some programs start at like age three, age four. I mean, they're little when they start those programs. And they have a program that goes all the way up through high school. And a lot of times in some towns, that whole youth program is run by the high school coaches. And I thought, yeah, they do, they do that. And they have feeder programs where your child is learning a very simplified version of the offense that the high school runs. And as they get older, they learn a more complex version. So that way, by the time a student gets into their freshman year, they are already 10 years into the offense, 10 years into the defense. They know the full playbook, and they're ready to play on that higher level because they've been fed into the program. And uh, he made this statement, and it, and it struck me. And he said, our football programs are more intentional about developing our children than the American church. And it hit me right in my chest. Because the thing is, it's the hobby, the sport, the skill, whatever it is, it's a vehicle to bring kids close to the Lord. The great thing about programs like Royal Rangers is, as Carl said, can, can you bait a hook? Great. Can you, can you load and, and, and shoot a rifle? Yeah. Can you set a trap? Yeah. Can you throw a spiral? Okay. Because it's not about baiting a hook. It's not about sweating a pipe. It's not about the activity. It's not about the skill set because the skill set is the vehicle to bring kids closer to the Lord. And if that's the goal, which it is the goal in Rangers and Girls Ministries, then you can use anything. You can use anything. I know there are Royal Ranger programs that utilize things like cooking to help reach. Why? Because it's reaching boys. That's what it's all about. As Carl said, we are facing an epidemic of young men who do not know what it is to grow up and be a godly man. And so what I love about this program, what I love about in, in what's needed in the church, is we don't need men who know how to throw a better spiral. We need men who know how to love their wives and love their children. And the program like Royal Rangers uses throwing a spiral, uses baiting a hook, uses changing a tire, those simple physical activities to help teach young men how to be a better husband, how to love their spouse, how to love their children, how to love God with all of their heart. So just for the next couple of minutes, I just want to encourage you with this. Discipleship, that's what we're talking about, discipleship. Now listen, you can go to Mardell today and see shelf after shelf lined with books on discipleship. You can go to any book retailer and look up the topic discipleship, and your head will swim with the sheer numbers of books about church growth and discipleship. I think we, as the American church, we've made it far too difficult. We've made it far too difficult, and to use football once again as an illustration, the offense schematics playbooks and defensive schematics and playbooks are so complicated now. It's, it's such a complex game, but here's what it comes down to, and oh you, we're learning it this season. 
as complex as it's gotten, football is still a pretty simple game. It's a game of inches. Blocking, tackling, running. If you don't block, you ain't going to score points. If you don't have an offensive line, it's going to protect the quarterback. You're not going to. Simple things. That's discipleship. We can make it as complex as we want to, but it's at the heart of discipleship. It's quite simple. I want to read a passage to you. And I love, love, love finding passages like this that many people consider kind of flyover passages that just kind of give you information about like what Jesus is doing and things like that. But there's so much just simple yet profound truth in them. You would think, oh, wow, I've read this so many times that I, I didn't know that it gives us instruction for discipleship today, but it does. One of the most profound examples of discipleship is very simply found in John chapter 1, verses 40 through 48, and I'm going to read it. And I'm going to read it, and you're going to go, that's really, that's the profound truth? Yeah, yeah, it is. You ready for it? One of the two who heard John speak, these are disciples, followers of John the Baptist, and followed him was Andrew. So one of the two was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first, this is Andrew, found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Saphos, which is translated Peter, which means rock. The next day he decided to go to Galilee. And he found Philip. And Jesus said to him, Follow me. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him who Moses wrote about in the law, and the prophets also saw Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come from Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said to him, He is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? And Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you, when you were under a fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered, answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. In the next just few minutes, as we are encouraged by your word about discipleship and what it truly means in our lives today, I pray that your truth would come alive within us. I pray that your spirit would be stirred within us and guide us and help us to disciple people. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. This morning is a call to discipleship. A call to discipleship. Everyone in here, we are called to be disciplers. And this is very simple. God gives us an example of what true discipleship is. And let me give you the headline. Let me give you spoiler alert. And if you take nothing from it today, take this. Discipleship, as complex as we make it, the heart of discipleship is simply this. You make a friend, and you take them with you. Make a friend, and take them with you. You have heard me say this before. As nice as your car or your truck or your SUV or your family wagon is, you cannot take it with you. The Maserati and the Ford Festiva on a long enough timeline will end up in the same place, which is the junkyard. All homes rot. Everything decays. You cannot cross your physical assets across the dimensional plane to heaven and take them into eternity with you. As much as we would love to load up the U-Haul and say, look, Lord, at everything I brought. I went to the flea market just a week before I passed and I loaded up. We're not taking it with us. 
there is one thing you can take with you. There is one thing that will cross that dimensional plane from this life to the next life, and that's somebody else. And this is what we are seeing. Two disciples, one by the name of Andrew, follows Jesus and says, you know what, I'm going to go get my brother, Simon. And so he gets his brother, Simon, and then God calls Nathaniel, the other of the disciples, and Nathaniel says, I'm sorry, Philip. And Philip says, hey, I'm going to go get my friend, Nathaniel, and bring him. You make a friend, and you take him with you. Let me give you just a couple encouragements that we see here. Number one, discipleship is taking the journey together. Taking the journey together. Andrew goes to Simon and says, come on, let's go together. Here's where we have messed up in the modern day church. Instead of joining together and let's do this together, we love in the church to point to other people and say, hey, let me show you the path that you need to take and go ahead and have fun. Let me break it down. Let me put it in real terms. When I was in high school and college, I worked at Walmart. Hi, welcome to Walmart. So glad we're happy to have you. That was me. I started out working in domestics. It was awesome. It was the only place they were hiring, the only department that was hiring it, and it was better than flipping burgers at McDonald's. So towels, and I worked with the, uh, the curtains, and I would be there, and these, these lovely ladies, you know, would come up and, sir, do you, is there somebody who works in this department? Ma'am, this is my department. Are you sure? Yes, ma'am, it's my department. I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking for some curtains. Okay, do you need a Valance? What size of window do you have? Do you, are you going to be bunting it? Or are you going to be spraying? You know, and I would go through the whole thing, and they're like, oh, you really do work this department? Yeah, yes, I do. <laughs> but why? Because it beats flipping burgers. Oh, okay. It would surprise you. It might shock you to know that there is a very strict rule about Walmart uh, called the 10-foot rule. Which is this, if anybody gets within at least 10 feet of you, you are to greet them and ask them how you can help them. Which is, is surprising because it rarely fleshes out that way. And I know I worked at Walmart because you could turn down an aisle and there could be somebody who sees you and they, who works there and they're like, Boop. it's like reverse groundhog day, you know, it's like cockroaches when the lights come on. And there's a rule, and part of the 10-foot rule is never tell someone where to go. Always take them. <laughs> that doesn't happen. I would know. I was that guy. And in my mind, I'm going, I know I'm supposed to take them. Yeah, all you got to do is just go down that way. And, and I would make up aisles. Yeah, you need to go to aisle 117 and turn at uh, aisle 4B, and then bingo, you're there. And then I'd be gone. But that's what we do with discipleship. That's what we do with getting closer to the Lord. We say, oh, what you got to do is you got to go this, 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 and you take that path, and I'll be here. That is not the definition of biblical discipleship. That's not what Jesus wants us to do. It's, you want to get closer to Jesus? That's amazing. That's where I'm going to. Let's go together. Let me walk on this journey with you. Let me walk beside you. Andrew brings Simon. As Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. You see, this is not Paul being braggadocious and saying, oh, you must follow me. Why? Because I know which way to go. It's no, I'm on this journey towards Christ. I'm not the leader of this trip. I'm not the, the leader of this parade. I'm just a part of it. And why don't we go together. You make a friend, take him with you. The second thing that we see is bring who you know. Bring who you know. Andrew gets who? His brother. Philip gets who? His friend. See, we make this difficult on ourselves. We think, oh, I've got to go out and I've got to go meet people that I don't know and then I've got to find people and then immediately tell them about Jesus. That's not what we're seeing here. It starts with your own circle of influence. 
and you have to make relationship before you enter into discipleship. But somehow, somewhere along the way, we get messed up with this, and we want to start with discipleship. Hi, who are you? I don't know, but do you know Jesus? Because you need to be discipled. Why don't we switch it up and start with, Hi, my name's Mark. Can I buy you coffee? Let me hear about who you are. You need to understand this, that the gospel causes and forces change within us. You cannot follow the gospel and not be changed. But discipleship is where you and I, we build relational bridges that support the weight of the gospel. But we don't want to do that. We want to just tell people, you got you to gotta get saved, sinner. Let's, once again, let's start with, hi, my name is. My name is. And that old saying goes that people don't care about how much you know until they know how much you care. And discipleship is building that relational bridge that supports the weight of the gospel. Is it going to take longer? Yeah. Is it going to be messy? Yes. But we're taking the journey with them, and we're bringing people that we know. Now, here's the thing. You may think, well, I don't know anybody who doesn't know the Lord. Well, step one, you're too insulated from the world around you. Because the Word of God says that we're to be in the world, not of the world. Not we're to be insulated from the world and never have any interaction with the world. We're to be the light in the darkness, and if you keep the light in a separate room, the darkness will never be illuminated. We've got to be in the world of the, and not of the world. So step number one is you've got to meet some people. Step one, meet somebody. Find out their name. Get to know them. There's what I always, I always call the 80-20 rule, which is this, and you might have heard me say this, but 80% of the time, conversations are about surface stuff. The weather. How's the weather? You know? How, the, well, how about them Cardinals? Which, by the way, how about them Cardinals? They're doing great. I always tell people, you know, when you're in youth ministry, the surface stuff, and you're talking with teenagers, so it's burps and belches and, and you know, things like that. Did you wear your deodorant, son? Not my son, other sons, some of y'all sons. Trust me, I was a youth pastor. Some of y'all sons don't wear deodorant. If they're telling you they do, they lying. Because by the time they got to me on Wednesday night, they's ripe. But you're talking about burps and belches and, and all kinds of stuff. 80%. But 20% though, 20% of the time they take you deep. And you got to be ready for it. Oftentimes we want to get to the 20% first. Hey, how you doing? Have you heard about this and that and sanctification, justification? And like, whoa, whoa. you got to wade through the 80 to get to the 20. Is it messy? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. And if you're like me, if you're a guy like me, man, you can take somebody to the 20 real quick. You know, hey, can you pass me that three fourths wrench? Okay. Did you hear about? The... I'm having problems with my wife. Whoa, whoa, we're talking about wrenches here a second ago. Now we're talking about your marriage. Yeah. That's how guys do it, right? We go, we go to that 20 quick. We don't go off in there, but we get there quick. Pass me a three-fourths wrench. Him and my, my wife is thinking about leaving me. You got to be ready for it. You got to be ready for it. So we see this example. They bring people they know. They bring people they know. We've got to be getting to know people. It's all about people. It's not about goals. It's not about the product. It's about the people. What I like about the Ranger program is they earn merits and they earn badges. Those badges are a vehicle to disciple kids. Because if we're all about badges, we'll, we'll, we'll get on Amazon today and buy a whole bunch of them, just pass them out. We'll be like Oprah Winfrey on uh, you know, that whatever, you, know, you get a badge, you get a badge, you all get a badge. You know, I mean, we're just, just give them out. But that's not what it's about. That's what the program's not about that. 
It's about using badges as a vehicle to wade through the 80% of the surface ordinary stuff that a child goes through, a young man goes through, to get to the 20% serious stuff. The third thing we see is look for the overlooked. And I love this. Jesus says, I saw you. Nathaniel, I saw you under the juniper tree. And this changes Nathaniel's life. Because at this time, Jesus is seeing him when nobody else saw him. He was being completely overlooked. And we have a generation of young boys and girls who are being overlooked. They're being overlooked by parents because their parents are either working two, three jobs to make ends meet or they're not there. They're being overlooked by the public school system because overcrowding in, in classrooms and, and understaffing and, and our teachers are just barely trying to get by, let alone give special attention to a child. And so you have a whole generation of kids who are slipping through the cracks and everybody's overlooking them. Let's get real. They're being overlooked in the church. Why? Because they're just so hard to deal with. They don't, they don't look like our good kids. They don't dress and act like our good kids. They don't fit the mold of the good kids, the good church kids who come in and they already know how to act. They know, say, yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. And they do this and they... And they're being overlooked. We need an army of men and women, aunts, uncles, grandmothers, grandfathers, to be spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers to the kids who are being overlooked. And I love this. Jesus looks at Simon and says, your name is Simon, but now from here on out, you're safe us. You're a rock. He sees in Simon what Simon doesn't even see in himself. I'm so thankful that I, I had people in my life who saw things in me that I couldn't even see in myself. Who poured resources and prayers into areas, into dreams and visions in my life that I could not even see myself. Can you think of somebody who did that for you? Can you think of somebody who poured into your life and saw things in your life, saw potential, saw skills, saw talents that you couldn't even see yourself? Simon was like, who? Peter, who? Rock, what? Do you know me? Yeah. Just like when the angel of the Lord comes to Gideon and says, oh, mighty man of valor. In the place where Gideon is hiding out, he's cowering, threshing wheat in a wine press. And the angel of the Lord says, O oh, mighty man of valor. Discipleship is you make a friend and you take him with you. And we do that by going on the journey together. Bringing who you know. Building relationships. Relationships come first. And then looking for the overlooked. If everybody would stand to your feet today, I challenge you. I challenge you to be a part of this journey and process. We need an army of people who will look for the overlooked. Who will go and bring people they know. Some of you, you know people. You know people are hurting. You need to start bringing them to church. Bring them with you. Don't tell them where to go. Link arms with them and bring them on the journey with you. Building relationships. Because listen, one area that we get, we've gotten messed up in the American church is we treat people like targets. Nobody likes to be treated like a target. Discipleship is not about putting somebody in your crosshairs and say, I'm going to get you. I'm going to shoot you with the truth of God and get you for Jesus. No. No, we're going to come together. We're going to link arms and we're going to walk on this journey together. And 
Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Is he saying, I have all the answers? He's, no. What is he saying? He's saying, I'm on the path heading toward the person who has all the answers. So let's go together. Make a friend and take him with you. If everybody would, bow your heads and close your eyes. Maybe for you in this place, you need to be on that journey. Say, Pastor Mark, I've... I feel like I'm far away from God. In fact, if I were to die this week, I'm not even sure where my eternal destination would be. You need to start that journey. He sees you. You may be sitting here or standing here thinking, nobody sees me, nobody sees what I'm going through. God does. He's right there with you. His spirit is right next to you. So the next step for you is to accept his spirit, accept his presence in your life, and accept his son as the Savior and Lord of your life. If that's you in this place, would you raise your hand so I can pray with you today? Anybody in this place? Most important decision you'll ever make. Yes, see a hand that's up. Anybody else? Come on, don't be afraid. Don't be shy. Maybe it's the first time in a long time, but you need to come back home. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I see another hand. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray over you today. And I want everybody in the room, just just pray this personally with me. I'm not going to give you words to recite. Those who raised your hand, it needs to be your own personal prayer. But this is simply what we're doing. We're just, we're asking God to come into our hearts. We're making Jesus the Lord of our life and asking him to cleanse us from the mistakes that we have made. And when we do that, we start that journey. We start that journey. If you would, let me pray over you today and you pray in your own words with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your spirit and your presence. I thank you for those who raise their hands to signify that they want to make Jesus the Lord of their life and submit their lives to you. And I thank you for those that even though they may not have raised their hands, they are making this commitment in their hearts because they know they know they need to make that change. They know they need to start that journey. So Lord, I ask right now for every single person in the room that you would cleanse us from our sins. You would make us a new creation. We accept that we have messed up, that we've fallen short. God, we believe that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross to, and he rose again so that we could have eternal life. We believe that. God, we confess that you are God, the one true God, and Jesus is the one Savior, Messiah, and Lord, and we give our lives to Jesus. And we ask him to be the Lord of our life. We thank you for these things. We celebrate for those who raise their hands. We celebrate for those that made this decision in their hearts. We rejoice for those who are made new, born again in you. In Jesus' name we pray. If you would keep your heads down and eyes closed, let me pray over you one last time. I'm going to ask this one, one more question. I'm going to ask those who are to raise their hands. God is looking for an army of disciples. See, the goal of discipleship is not just to know more about God or to be a connoisseur of church things. The goal of discipleship is to be a discipler, to make a friend and take him with you. That's the essence of it. That's the heart. Make a friend, take him with you. So all across this place, will you answer the call to be a discipler? If you're brave enough to answer that call and say, yeah, I want to be a discipler in my life. And I want to make a friend and take him with me. Would you raise your hand all across this place? Yeah, hands going up. Listen, it may be getting involved in a ministry like the Rangers ministry. Keep your hands up. Go ahead. And maybe get involved in a ministry like girls' ministry. Maybe get involved in youth. Maybe get involved in our children's ministry. It may be getting involved in our Christmas production on the worship band. It may be getting involved going out every Tuesday night with our homeless outreach, feeding the homeless. Whatever it may be, there is an opportunity, and God is calling you to go deeper, to go further, to answer the call to be a disciple. Let me pray over you that God would stir in your heart an opportunity and, and where you can go and how you can be a disciple. How you can make a friend and take
take them with you. Heavenly Father, I pray for every single person in this room. I pray for your spirit just to stir in their hearts. God, the need for them to be a disciple, to make a friend, take them with them. Lord, I pray that you would create opportunities this week as we are obedient to you and obedient to your word, that you would take us down that path so that we can bring somebody else along with us on that journey. We thank you for all these things. And Lord, as we do this, I pray that you would open up the windows of blessing, the windows of heaven to pour out your spirit, your anointing, your blessing upon each and every home that's represented. Protect them, protect marriages, protect families today, protect men and women on the job site today in this crazy, crazy world that we are living in. Lord, I pray protection and guidance and wisdom for every person in this room. We thank you and let your blessing just rain down on them. We glorify you and praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody in the house said, amen, amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Hey, if you're new to Crossroads, this is your first week or first you know, couple of weeks, we have a guest reception just through door number one to my right. We have a gift for you. We've got some pastors who would love to meet you. We also have a special reception for Creek Scales today in our event center. Uh, we got cake and refreshments there as well. Hang out with us. God bless you. Have a great week.